Okay, welcome everyone to um, the last day of uh, SBMF uh, 2020. Um, good morning to Brazil in uh, Europe. For me and Martin, it's uh, around lunchtime. Thank you for joining us for uh, the last keynote of SBMF by uh, Professor Martin Leuker from the Institute for, of Software Engineering and Programming Languages from the University of Lübeck in Germany. Um, Martin uh, has already been a uh, contributor to um, regular SBMF conferences in the past. So uh, we are very happy to have him here today um, with a very timely topic on verification of um, neural networks. So Martin obtained his PhD from um, RWTH Aachen University in 2002 and uh, then did his uh, habilitation in 2007 at the Technical University of Munich. And um, between Aachen and uh, Lübeck, he uh, traveled uh, the world quite a bit. He has been in um, a research associate at the University of Pennsylvania. He has been uh, at uh, Uppsala University in Sweden. Then he was uh, in Munich until uh, finally he settled in uh, northern Germany, where we can see uh, he today is enjoying uh, very nice weather. So Martin has published uh, over 100 of peer-reviewed uh, publications. If you look at his, or if I look at his DBLP entry, it always makes me quite jealous. He has uh, worked on topics uh, such as uh, automata learning, model checking, verification techniques, but um, he is also um, in charge of um, more practical applications of software engineering. He's running a number of um, regional and national German projects in industry. Um, projects on digital twins, Industry 4.0. And I was very happy to be with Martin in a uh, European Horizon 2020 project, uh, the QEMS project on, um, use, uh, on formal verification of, of software running on multi-core processors, not the processors itself, but monitoring the software and doing uh, what we call uh, runtime, verifi uh, runtime verification. But today, Martin is going uh, to talk about um, a hot topic uh, that uh, none of us apparently can uh, escape. Machine learning is everywhere. So uh, please, Martin, uh, go ahead and tell us what we as formal methods people should make of machine learning. Yeah, thank you very much, Volker, for the kind introduction. And uh, thanks for inviting me and giving me the chance to share my ideas or actually also to share the ideas that we develop within the larger group. And um, so one of our projects is together with a crowd of French people and some Germans. So the work that I'm presenting here is together with uh, people from France, from Paris, and uh, but also some further Germans, uh, well, Germans, Indian people, but working in, uh, in Germany from Kaiserslautern. And we have a so-called Learnify uh, project. And uh, it's between France and Germany and gives us some travel money to explore this kind of topic that I'm reporting on here. So the, the topic is formal verification of neural networks. And as Volker said, uh, I mean, I have quite some publications and uh, especially when you're a PhD student, you're supposed to publish quite a lot. And uh, how can you get good publications? Well, there are two possibilities. The one you really um, solve extremely good pr uh, problems, open problems, and you publish about it. The other strategy is to really dig into new topics where nobody else is working in, and then you also get your pap uh, papers accepted. And the, set, uh, the second strategy is more, uh, in some sense more successful because you don't have to be so smart. Yeah? If you go to the open problems, then uh, that could be really tough. And if you want to optimize your citations, then you should go for the open problems, uh, for the new problems rather than for longstanding open problems. Anyway, so what are we doing? Well, we basically do verification, runtime verification, model checking, um, all this kind of stuff. Um, and neural networks are a hot topic. So we want to do formal verification of neural networks. That's kind of uh, the plan. 
And uh, as you see, I, I added a question mark to that because from a formal point of view or from a software engineering point of view, this may be questionable. Uh, anyway, um, I present some, in the first part, I present some more software engineering questions. And in the end, I will also try to uh, present some meat that we came up with. So what is verification? Well, verification comprises all methods showing that a system adheres to its specification. Yeah, so you know this from your second year at uh, university. You have to show that the specification is satisfied by the system. You can do that using model checking, for example. And that's uh, now we would say, okay, we have to verify neural networks. However, when we look at application areas of uh, machine learning, then it's typically used, it's typically successful when we don't even have a formal specification. Yeah, so when, for example, we want to uh, to, to check whether a cat is on the picture, like you can see it here, what is the formal specification of a cat? Yeah, you can say, okay, a cat has two, ear, uh, has two eyes, a nose, two ears. It also has a tail. Yeah, but I mean, on this picture, we don't see the tail of the cat. Yeah, well, you can imagine that the, t the cat would have a tail, but the, the picture is cutted a little bit. Yeah, so you would come up with the specification, okay, it has two ears, two eyes, and the nose, and probably a tail, unless the tail is outside of the picture and so on. Um, but the specification that I just gave also fits perfectly for dogs, right? So it's extremely hard in, in certain application areas uh, to come up with a precise specification. It may be also hard to, to come up with a, a verification algorithm showing that the specification is met. But one of the, the few questions, uh, the, the important question is what is really the thing that we're going to verify in this situation when we don't have a formal specification. So if we think about verification of recurrent neural networks, well, the simple answer is we're done. There is no specification, we don't have to do anything. Yeah? So there's no research question. Well, on the other hand, if you think about uh, where is machine learning applied? Well, as I said, in the application areas where it's difficult to come up with a specification, but it's also used in safety critical domains, where you would like to have some kind of formal uh, notion of uh, correctness. Yeah, you may remember the example of a, or the, the crash of a Tesla, where Tesla was driving on a, a street and there was a truck and um, there was a white truck and the algorithm considered the truck to be a cloud and just tried to go through the cloud. Unfortunately, uh, it was a truck and the driver died. So machine learning is used in safety critical areas. So we somehow have to analyze um, the, the resulting network that is learned. But uh, we have to be careful with the notion that we're using. So you also know from your uh, second year, that validation comprises all the methods showing that the system adheres to the client's needs. Yeah, so the right question to ask in some sense for machine verification of machine learning would be, well, we have to validate the system. That means we both have to come up with the intended needs of the user, of the client. That's one of the problems. And the second problem then is we want to formalize these needs to be able to do a formal verification. Yeah. And what are typical general, so, so what we're doing is we want to validate systems rather than to verify. Yeah, it's also rephrased in the sense that are we building the right product? Now, what is the right product in the setting of machine learning? So we have to imagine what our client wants to do. There are, of course, very specific questions to be analyzed for each net, but there are also some general ones. And that brings me to the topic of trustworthy AI. That is a term that is uh, used very often right now. And it's the, there is a, a European expert group. So basically 20, 30 researchers that are well known in Europe defined a small, uh, I don't know, 10 pages paper on trustworthy AI. And the main idea is any AI system should be lawful, should respect the applicable laws and regulations. 
it should be ethical, it should respect ethical principles and values, and it should be robust, both from a technical perspective, but also taking into account the social environment. So that gives us some idea what we should expect from every AI system. Well, actually, the definition is a little bit, um, it's kind of boring because um, any kind of system that we're building, it should respect the laws, right? When we build a software system, it should respect existing laws. And it should also be more or less ethical, right? And it should also be robust. So this is nothing really specific for AI, at least to my opinion. Nevertheless, it gives us some guidance. Yes, of course, also for AI-based systems, we have to consider that it respects the law, that it's ethical and that it is robust. If you continue reading this document, they um, de define seven key requirements. And so for making sure that you respect the law and you're ethical and so on, um, they discuss seven requirements. And these are the ones that may be formalized and checked on systems. And what is that? Well, the system should be human centric. It should be resilient. Resilient means um, if it crashes, then it should quickly come back. Yeah, for example, if you steer your car with a uh, AI based system and the system crashes, I mean, the, the, the AI part crashes, then it should reboot and come back immediately so that the, the system can be used again. It should be secure. You should um, um, ensure security requirements and it should of course also be safe. It should respect privacy um, uh, demands. And uh, that of course is, I mean, we expect that also from every kind of software system, but it's maybe very important when you train your system based on a lot of data. And it should be transparent. Meaning, for example, if you ask for a loan and an AI-based system checks whether you get the loan or whether you get a mortgage for your house and so on, and you are not approved, then you want to know why does the, did the system really come to this uh, result? So there's a transparency requirement. And another requirement is uh, that the system should be fair. It should uh, make sure that there is no unfair bias Maybe you have heard about the, uh, the system that was used by Amazon for doing a pre-scan of the applications. Yeah, and it turned out that uh, female applications were treated worse than uh, male applications. Now the question is, um, why did it happen? Did, was the system kind of wrong? Well, I mean, on one principle this was wrong, but it was trained on existing data. So, as uh, female applications were also um, not well treated by, uh, human, by the humans, the same problem ended up in the system. Yeah? And of course, if you train the data, if you train the system based on data and you want the system to behave as the typical examples, well, this is not really what you want to do. You want to train the system from existing data that is improved so that it doesn't have some kind of unfair bias. Yeah, that's kind of one thing to boil it down to, to requirements. And the last uh, requirement is uh, that is mentioned is accountability. So that you make sure that the system is also, for example, able or that we are able to see why the system came up with a certain solution. Uh, maybe just by logging the different kind of decisions, maybe logging the sensor values that were taken into account when steering the car and so on. So uh, what I basically try to suggest is validate the, the trustworthiness of your system. So I can see there's a kind of research agenda. We have key requirements, key seven, uh, seven key requirements that are formulated in English text. But for us working in formal methods, one of the uh, the task that we could work on, what we probably even should work on is, what uh, do these seven requirements mean in a formal notation? And what could be corresponding algorithms to check these kind of requirements? 
I don't have any idea to that. So I don't present any further uh, motivation in this direction. Um, but nevertheless, I think this is an important topic to work on. Yeah, let's work on formalization of uh, certain kind of these requirements. And um, what would be the right way to approach uh, using the techniques that we're usually doing? Well, one answer would be model checking, meaning a formal specification or a, formal, a formalization of one of these seven requirements could end up in a temporal logic formula. And we could verify the temporal logic formula for the uh, network under consideration. And uh, now, now we come back to the question then, how can we verify neural networks? Yeah, so assume that we have a good, that the specification is given, how can we verify a network? And I would like to give you one example here, and that is the how to verify recurrent neural networks. It's a form of recurrent neural net, it's a form of neural networks that have a kind of state-based notion. And state-based notion, this is, uh, what we're used in model tracking, we have state-based systems, so that is closer to what we're used to. And uh, I would like to introduce you to one method that we defined, and that is property-directed verification. So what does verification mean? Well, we have a system and the system has uh, certain executions. And we want to make sure that a certain kind of bad execution never occurs. We're kind of in a linear time setting here, so we only talk about sequences. So, in a sense, when we look at our uh, when we look at our, the runs of our system, there should be a subset of, in this case, a complement of the bad runs. And how can we do that? Well, we can do that using model checking. And the model checker basically says yes, uh, the, the property is verified, or it says no, there is a problem, and may give back a counterexample. All right, so um, how, does it, how is it done practically? Typically the system is given as a transition system. The specification is also given as a transition system or an automaton in, in most of the cases, while very often also temporal logic formula that is then translated into an automaton. Um, but from the model checking point of view, we can consider both the, the system and the specification to be given in terms of uh, Automata, the model checker gets the system, it gets a specification, it builds the cross product, and then it tries to make sure that the bad state is uh, not reached. Uh, so, oh, sorry, the bad state is not reached. Um, basically, doing kind of graph analysis of this uh, joint um, of the cross product of the system and the specification. So model checking goes back to the 80s. It was introduced by actually four people, Clark and Emerson in the US and Kiel and Sifakis on, on the European side. They recently, three of them recently got the Turing Award. You can see on the left hand, uh, picture, on the left hand side, you can see Edmund Clark. Then in the middle, it's Alan Emerson and Joseph Sifakis is the guy on the right. Kiel somehow left uh, research or at least didn't continue with model checking. So he's not uh, among of the Turing winners. Um, so if you start to work on a kind of topic, probably it should benefit benefits if you stay working on this topic and don't leave too early. And um, yeah, well, now that's the standard way, but what can we do when we have a black box? Well. What, what does it mean that we have a black box? For example, we have legacy code. We have really don't have access to the code. The code is not open. It's a third party software. It's an embedded system. There is, I, we don't really understand the code and don't have access to the code. What could we do then? Well, um, the idea is that we still want to do the very same stuff. We cannot really give the black box to the model tracker, but we can use a learning algorithm. And the learning algorithm, checks the black box, ask queries to the black box, eventually comes up with a model. And then the model can be sent to the model checker and we can do the very same stuff as before. Is there a kind of learning algorithm? Well, one approach that is there since the 80s 
is uh, the method by Dana Angloin. And uh, it's the so-called L-star algorithm that is used for learning uh, automata based on membership queries and equivalence queries. The idea of inferring from given behavior an automaton model that goes back to the 50s, so that's already rather old. And there is a very nice uh, communications of the ACM um, edition on model learning. The main contributor was uh, Fritz van Drager, where he explained uh, the, the variations of the L-star algorithms and interesting applications. There is a, his group is using that for verifying lots of different uh, embedded uh, systems and uh, implementations. All right, so uh, how does the algorithm work? Assume that um, here we have the language A or B star, then a B followed by either A or B. And um, we can see that as a function FL that gives us a zero for each um, word that is not in the language and gives us a one um, for each word that is in the language. So we can denote the language of the system by the characteristic function. Now, what is the learning algorithm doing? It asks, connects to the system and eventually, eventually it will produce the right automaton, which you can see, see here on the right. Now, if we could do that, then we could do model checking. And uh, yeah, that's kind of the, the part we, we want to do. But uh, how does the learner work? Well, it asks membership queries, so-called membership queries to the system. So it asks, for example, is epsilon in the language? Is A in the language? Is B accepted by the system? Is A, B, and so on? And it somehow writes the information uh, down into, a, into the right form, which is that of a table. And the table had, has an upper part here, and it has a lower part that is shown in green. And how does the algorithm work? Well, basically it asks uh, a word, yeah, for example here, epsilon. Uh, strictly speaking, it asks a word together with a suffix. Yeah, here it asks, is the prefix epsilon together with a suffix epsilon, which is still epsilon, is it accepted? Well, let's check, no, I mean, the empty word is not in the language, so we denote a zero here. And that looks pretty much like the state of the system. And, um, okay, we also ask the same stuff for A and B and denote it here in the lower part. Yeah, a, a is also not accepted by itself. B is also not accepted by itself. So the result is also zero. Now we have the upper part and that repre represents the state of the system. Yeah, so we have one state of the system that's for epsilon. And we may use the lower part for transitions. More specifically, if we take this epsilon here and we add an A, when we come to this row, this row looks exactly like this one. So we say, okay, if there is an A successor, we are in the very same state, we stay in the state, and then for a B successor, the, the same stuff. Now that, that looks like a, an automaton where we have one state and we know the transitions. And uh, well, we call this table coherent, closed and consistent, and we derive an automaton. Yeah, so the state here is exactly that one of this row. And the A successor, well, let's see, how do we come to an A successor? Oh, it's also this, the very same state. Yeah, same with the B. Now, is that really the automaton representing the language? Well, let's ask an equivalence oracle. Yeah, and the equivalence oracle basically tries to check whether uh, this guy is the same. Well, in this, in this case, we see, no, it's not because for example, BA, BA is not accepted by this automaton, but BA is accepted here. So it returns back the BA as a counter example to the learner. So the learner knows, okay, something went wrong learning uh, BA. And so it writes down the BA together with the prefixes. So um, we have, we see here, now it's a state one. So we need at least two states. And uh, we also add the A and the B successor 
of uh, this B8. And we also add the B successor and uh, of B, yeah. And we also add the A successor, but this is this guy already. So that's now a table. And uh, can can this be the table of an automaton? Well, not really, right? Why? Because here we have a state, and with an A successor, we go to an we stay in the same state. Now here for this guy, we have an A successor and go to a different state. If we have a deterministic automaton, well, we have to go to the very same state using an A. So we have to make sure that these two states uh, or these two states are different. So we have to make sure that these states are different. Well, why are these states different? Well, they have different successes. They have different A successes. So these two states can be distinguished using an A, right? So we add a column to our table because with an A, we can distinguish these two guys. Now, okay, we see we have at least uh, three states, 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 0. Well, when filling the table, we see we also have a state 1, 1. Ah, so the table is not closed. We should uh, move up this guy to the upper part. Now we see we have four states and we also add A and B successes, yeah. And uh, the table is closed and consistent, so it's coherent. We build the automaton and the conformance check says yes. And uh, now we can use this model for model checking. Yeah, that's kind of the, the general idea in combining model checking and uh, automata learning. All right, can we use the very same idea for recurrent neural networks? Well, we can in general, um, if we consider the recurrent neural network as a binary classifier. Yeah, what is a recurrent neural network? Basically, you can think of it as a kind of huge uh, matrix or huge network, and you feed K plus L values into the system, and you get out K uh, values, get a, and the K uh, values are the, the K vector here represents a state. You read a new input, and then the recurrent neural network uh, returns a new state of the system, and it also returns an output, the current value of the uh, uh, sequence that you have read. We do a restriction here because we want to model our system with an, using an alphabet. So uh, we consider only to have a finite alphabet here for the input. And um, of course, if you then have one letter, you can extend it to words. And we need the output. The output is given basically as uh, a vector from the state, which tells us whether the word is in the language or it's not in the language. Yeah, so in that sense, the recurrent neural network can be considered as an automaton, but as an infinite state automaton because we have uh, real valued entries uh, in our network. So typically uh, it defines the language acceptor, a recurrent neural network but uh, one with an infinite state space. And what could correctness of an RNN mean? Well, one thing would be to say, okay, we define a specification using an automaton epsilon over our alphabet sigma, and we wanna have language e equality. So the language of the recurrent neural network should be equal to the language given by our specification. So we specify correct, correct behavior using a finite D of A. And um, well, that would be a little bit restrictive because as I said, I mean, typically the recurrent neural network has an infinite state space and for, for hopefully for good reasons. So um, if we would claim, or if we would consider such kind of a correctness notion, then um, we would require the recurrent neural network to be a regular language or to define a regular language, which would be a huge restriction. Okay, so um, another notion would be to say, okay, we have the negative behavior and we should make sure that our recurrent neural network only uh, produces words that are not negative. Yeah, and that boils down to a subset uh, problem because uh, we have to make sure that the language of R, the language of R is a subset uh, of the language of the complement. Yeah, this is the white stuff. And DFA is easily complemented, so that's a yeah, 
a reasonable verification question. Another one would be to say that uh, we define the positive behavior and our recurrent neural network should not miss any positive behavior. Again, this is a subset problem. Well, you could say, well, this is a subset that uh, the language of P is a subset of the language of R, but you can also phrase it the other way around. The uh, language of the recurrent neural network complemented should be a subset of uh, the positive uh, specification complemented. And again, this guy is easy to complement. The recurrent neural network is not easy to complement because of this infinite uh, yeah, this, this guy. Um, but the queries to the recurrent neural network is uh, the word in the language or not, that uh, can easily be complemented. So basically the verification notion that we're using is inclusion checking. Is the language of the recurrent neural network included in the language of some DFA? Okay, let's give an example. For example, we want to recognize XML documents. Uh, we have a regular negative specification saying that there is an opening tag that is not eventually followed by a corresponding closing tag. Yeah, of course, we cannot check the right nesting in a regular specification, but we could at least see whether there is some opening tag. We can define this as a, an automaton. And for example, uh, list item, not item, and then this opening item that is not closed, that's a bad behavior, that's a negative example, and having two opening uh, items and then afterwards one closing, that would be fine according to the specification. Okay, and when we can check whether our recurrent neural network is a subset of uh, the complement of N. Okay, um, now, um, how can we do this concretely? Checking that the language of R uh, is a subset of the language of A. Uh, so one approach is statistical model checking. And uh, so what is statistical model checking? We can come back to that, I explain that slightly later. Another approach that I would like to show is uh, automaton abstraction and model checking using model learning. And uh, last but not least, our property directed verification um, approach. So what is statistical model checking? Statistical model checking is basically a form of testing. Yeah, so the idea is you randomly sample a number of uh, words, you run the words on the uh, specification and you run the words of the RNN and you measure whether the words are treated in the same way. You can even do this more formally. You can uh, define two parameters, epsilon and gamma. Then you sample a number of words, the logarithm of two divided by epsilon divided by two to the square of gamma. So there is like some hefting inequality or that tells you how many words to sample. And then you run these words that you sampled on the specification and on the recurrent neural network. And if you find some word that is in the recurrent neural network, but not allowed by the specification, you have a property, you have a counterexample for sure. Yeah, the property is not satisfied. On the other hand, if you don't find such a guy, well, can you really be sure that the system is correct? You might've missed the counterexample, that's right. But at least one can uh, prove that uh, the recurrent neural network is absolutely approximately correct with a properly, probability at least one minus gamma. Yeah, so basically what is absolute uh, approximately correct? Well, you measure the set of counterexamples. You measure the set of words that are not correct according to your specification. And the measure of this set is smaller than epsilon, that if you take enough counterexamples, but you have a certain error probability. So this is an approach which relies on probability distribution. It may require many queries. Yeah, so depends on epsilon and gamma, how many words to check. Now, let me come to the idea of uh, automaton abstraction and model checking. Well, as you may have guessed by the introduction by all the machinery that we built up, 
let's use uh, a learning algorithm like uh, the automaton learner. Yeah, so we could learn via L star a model of our system using membership queries until we have a model. With the equivalence queries, um, we can update the model until it says, yes, it's the right system. And then we can basically use model checking. Yeah. So let's use L star uh, together with equivalence checks to get the right model. And then we could do model checking. Well, the problem is that the language of R is not necessarily regular. And if the language, if the underlying language that you're trying to learn is not regular, then basically it's not clear that the learning algorithm is terminating. Yeah, so the, the automaton is trying to get bigger and bigger uh, or is getting bigger and bigger, approximating this kind of recurrent neural network. And uh, yeah, you can easily think of if you have a push down system, yeah, where you have an arbitrary growing stack, uh, well, you can try to encode that into an automaton. What would you do? Yeah, you would uh, have a state for the stack having one element, maybe two elements, three elements. If the stack uh, is modeled up to size 500, then you have up to 500 states and so on. But you can see, I mean, this will hardly terminate uh, when you try to do that. Uh, and then similar things happen if you use Anglin's algorithm. So what could you do? Of course, you could say, let's introduce a bound. And I'm happy with a bound. Yeah. So if the automaton is big enough, a few hundred states, then you say, yeah, it's close enough to our recurrent neural network, and we do that. And that's an approach published uh, two years ago by Meyer and Newby. Um, the equivalence check here in this paper is also done using statistical model checking. Yeah. So it relies on the probability distribution, but it also, it's not correct because it may have spurious counterexamples or it may be a miss certain kind of counterexample. Yeah, because you have the bound here and because you have a statistical model checking here, um, it doesn't give you any kind of guarantee. But anyway, yeah, one could do that to at least find certain kind of counterexamples. A different approach, and that goes back to Weiss, Goldberg, and Yahav, is uh, extracting automata from recurrent neural networks using queries and counterexamples. So it's kind of similar idea. Um, rather than doing the uh, but rather than doing the equivalence check with the statistical model checking, they do a comparison with an abstraction. So with a different model that they get by an abstraction of the underlying system. Yeah, so they use L star using membership queries, producing a model, but when doing the equivalence check, rather than uh, doing statistical model checking, comparing the system with the recurrent neural network, they basically say, let's uh, use a different kind of learning algorithm building an abstraction B, and let's try to compare with that. If the equivalence check says yes, um, well, then uh, the algorithm stops. And if no, then it checks whether there is a word in uh, this abstraction, but uh, sorry, whether every word in the abstraction is also into the recurrent neural network, and uh, if that is the case, then it means that the difference between, uh, then the equivalence check fails because B is not according to the model, then the model should be improved. Yeah. So if B conforms with R, then the equivalence check fails because B is not conforming to, to the model. So we can improve the model, feeding back the counterexample to L star. If there is a difference between B and R, then it means that the abstraction here is not good. So we can do a refinement for this abstraction. Now, so we are building simultaneously two different kinds of models and compare them. Well, uh, once, we are, once we are done, 
we can do model checking on this kind of model. The advantage, if you want to call it an advantage, is that it does not rely on a probability distribution. Yeah, because you use different kind of learning algorithms and you don't have to do any kind of statistical model checking. And sometimes it's hard to define this, uh, the, the right distribution because you have to define the, distri the random distribution for choosing your examples according to what really happens in practice. Yeah, Because you want to make sure that the thing works in practice. But the problem is the counterexample may be spurious yeah, because you have some approximation here, you have some approximation here, you're comparing these guys, sometimes you're comparing those guys, uh, but if you don't see a difference between these guys, then you say you're fine and then you do the model tracking, but it may not really be that you have the, that you have gathered the right behavior of the recurring neural network. We implemented both approaches, statistical model checking and these uh, automaton abstraction model checking. Uh, you can see, for example, we found 122 mistakes on, we checked it on 30 DFAs and 138 specifications. Um, so using roughly 280,000 membership queries, you found these mistakes, but the length of the counter examples was quite high. Using AAMC, it took much longer time. We had a, a large number of queries, but we got short counterexamples. And that is, uh, helps us to understand the, the, the counterexample. Okay, uh, we thought then, can we do better? And that brought us to the notion of property directed verification. Well, um, it's very heavily inspired on uh, what is called black box checking that was invented by Doran Pellet and uh, Moshe Vardy and Jana Karkis in 99. And the idea is um, let's not first learn and then do model checking, but let's do uh, both at the same time. Yeah, so we have our uh, system R. We uh, eventually produce an hypothesis H with the learning algorithm. Yeah, and then we could do the equivalence checking. Um, but we don't do the equivalence checking. What we do, we do model checking. Here we said the hypothesis is based on the queries of R. So it shares some properties with the R and N. Uh, we don't really want to do an equivalence checking now, but let's do model checking. Well, if the model checking uh, comes up with a counter example, meaning that uh, I hope a lot of these uh, accepts a run that is not accepted, it's not okay according to the specification. Well, it could be spurious, right? The counter example is indeed accepted also by the underlying recurrent neural network. If that is the case, we really found a bug and we can go back to the program and say, look, there's a bug in your recurrent neural network. If not, then it means it's a bug of our hypothesis, but not of our uh, recurrent neural network. So we feed it back to the learning algorithm and say, please improve your hypothesis. If the model checking succeeds, well, then it could be the case that we have, uh, that we're done. Well, is, is that true? Well, we have to check whether our, our hypothesis is really equivalent to our recurrent neural network R. Well, actually we are checking whether, um, it should be on the next slide. Actually, we're checking whether the language of the recurrent neural network is a subset of the hypothesis automaton. We don't have to check equivalence. Why? Because according to our verification condition, the language of R should be a subset of the language of A. If it's a subset of H and H is shown to be a subset of A, we're done. Yeah, so, and that we, we have to check this inclusion probability and we can do that using statistical model checking as we did before. And if that is the case, then we know that our uh, system is epsilon approximately correct with a high probability, with this one minus delta. Um, yes, if that is not the case, 
Well, we've seen a mismatch between R and H. So we can feed it back to our learning algorithm to improve the hypothesis. Yeah, so we're improving the, we are improving the hypothesis based on model checking, but also based on um, inclusion checking. And sometimes we improve it because of this, sometimes because of that. So we have an interweaving of learning and model checking. Now um, let's look at uh, some measurements. So uh, the approach works quite fast. We get short counter examples. We also found a lot of mistakes using quite a small number of membership queries. And of course, it's, uh, we have to be uh, fair and to say, okay, property directed verification was built for verification. And the other approaches using abstraction and uh, learning models, they were not exactly tailored for a very specific property. They want to define a kind of surrogate model of the underlying RNN. Yeah, so it's uh, it's kind of um, yeah, maybe it's 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 clear that they um, perform less beneficial when when doing verification. Nevertheless, it makes sense to combine the, the two approaches as we did that. It's also possible that. Um, we have the specification and we define a certain kind of um, short counter example in the specification. And we can using a kind of pumping argument, pump up uh, counter examples so that we from, from a few counter examples, few short counter examples, we get actually what is called the faulty flow. Yeah? So a number of different ones in the same feeling. All right, so uh, I'm summing up. So validation of recurrent neural networks of machine learning alg algorithms seems more important than their verification. So there are two very important uh, questions. What is it really that we want to verify? Yeah. So take the needs of the client and come up with formalizations that we can which we then can build generic algorithms. A set of generic uh, requirements would be those that are defined for defining trustworthy systems. And um, the extraction of finite state information from this infinite state RNN is helpful, could be helpful for their verification and especially property directed verification um, is a kind of suitable method for finding short counter examples fast. All right, um, so what would be further steps to do? Well, of course, formalization of trustworthy requirements, uh, looking for more practical applications of PDV. And um, yeah, so we were using the whole machinery in a kind of uh, automaton setting where we have what is accepted or it's rejected. But the learning algorithms equally work fine in settings where you have more machines or million machines. Yeah, so where you have a range of different outputs. So one could lift the whole approach that is described here uh, to richer settings where we only not only have a binary classifier, but an n array classifier. And uh, last but not least, the verification of RNN, of RNN based agent environment systems. Yeah, so here we have a single system, but if we have several systems working together, how can we verify them? Yeah, so that would go with, uh, would, would lead us to questions of game based setting. And another direction one could explore is. Um, using learning algorithms for context-free languages. Yeah, so going beyond regular specifications. So thank you very much for your attention and I'm uh, happy to take your questions. Thank you very much, Martin. Um, we have already some questions in the chat. I'll read them for you from uh, Patricia Machado. I have a question, very nice and inspiring talk. I think we all agree. Um, oops, thank you. It's scrolled. 
Uh, regarding automaton abstraction, it seems that the effectiveness of the approach is largely dependent on the membership queries. How do we produce them in general? Are software testing data selection techniques applicable? Um, I mean, the, the, the plain idea of uh, L star is um, it's kind of clear when to uh, what kind of questions to ask because you want to fill the table in a very generic or in a very simple way. So you have the A successor that is missing in the table. So you take a word and add an A. Uh, well, you have a certain kind of freedom is when it comes to, um, to counter examples. Yeah, so if you produce long counter examples, you will enrich uh, the table in a kind of uh, very, uh, in a very heavy way. So it could be helpful to keep the, the automaton learning algorithm um, or to keep the table small to look for short counter examples. It could, I think if you want to learn abstractions of real systems, yeah, the, the work that Fritz van Drage is doing, then I think all these kind of methods for building equivalence classes of, uh, of uh, paths through your program that you also do in testing, that they could be very helpful to find uh, interesting kind of queries. But for the, let's say, for the direct setting, I'm not so sure. Okay, thank you. Uh, Gustavo, do you want to go ahead with the next question yourself? Yes, sure. Uh, so uh, thank you for the great talk. Uh, in some uh, regulated uh, domains, uh, using AI is not recommended when seeking for a higher safety integrity levels. So do you think that this recommendation will change in, in the future? And if so, how would this impact on the certification of safety critical systems? Well, we are uh, we have a large project that we are participating in uh, where the idea is to build medical devices using AI technology. And we are exactly addressing the question, is it possible to, um, yeah, to let the systems enter the market? And uh, according to the regulations, I would say, um, well, in, in some sense, the system that we're building is a, still a software system, but it's trained wire examples. But if you have the neural network fixed, and then you basically have the, the software running the neural network, so it can be considered as a software system. But the question is, how do we test these kind of guys? Yeah, so what is, why is it easy to, maybe not easy, but why is it much easier to, to use a manually or a humanly written program uh, run in a kind of safety critical system? And because we know that the programmer is not stupid. Yeah, the programmer makes choices and says, okay, uh, if, I, if I go on the left lane, I should be do this. And if I go, should go on the right lane and you can map these requirements, you can trace them into the code. Yeah, so when you check the code, you know why there is an if then else, because you have a requirement for that. And uh, when you do testing, well, we do a black box, uh, we do black box checking, we formulate equivalence classes based on the requirements. Then we look into the code and we do a coverage analysis. We check all if then else and all this kind of stuff. And that gives us some, reasonable um, assurance that the system is done well. Now, what do we do in, uh, in machine learning? In machine learning, we basically give, you a, give the system millions of examples, and then we cross fingers and hope that something reasonable comes out. Yeah, we test it on certain kind of examples, but if the system is doing a choice and accepts certain things and rejects others, we have no clue why. And uh, well, there is, well, there is the, 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 there is some research, of course, going on in, in this area where they check it especially for adversarial examples. And this kind of research, and this is, uh, or the results of this research is needed 
Um, and then I think one could uh, also approve safety critical um, machine learning, uh, machine learned systems for safety critical areas. But I think the whole testing theory for, um, for machine learning based software has to be done in a new way. And that's where I, I also see a lot of, uh, where I see a reasonable chance for formal methods people to contribute to AI. Usually the AI people, they feed uh, examples to the machine learning algorithms, they test it on 100 examples, it works fine, and then you apply it in some area, which is of course not the understanding I think we, sh we have and we should have. Okay, thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Okay, we have another question in the chat from uh, Rodrigo Pereira Cruz. Thank you for the great talk, Dr. Martin. Uh, when it comes to the model checking of neural networks, would the statistical model checking approach be applicable or at least considered for other complex networks such as spiking neural network? Uh, now you got me, I'm not an expert on neural networks. I don't really know what spiking neural networks are. But uh, in general, the, the idea of statistical model checking is completely reluctant to the underlying system. Yeah, so in the statistical model checking, uh, we don't know that it is really a, a recurrent neural network. Yeah, so it, and that may also be a weakness. Yeah, we, we don't know the structure of the recurrent neural network. So if you, look, if you know how the system was built, maybe you can do more efficient stuff. But the statistical model checking is in a, in a sense, yeah, very reasonable, but at the same time also very dumb. Yeah, if you know how the user is behaving in the system, if he presses typically a hundred times button one and only sometimes button B, then let's check the system for a lot of presses button one and only a few buttons B and it behaves fine on that and then it behaves well in practice. That's kind of the idea. And so um, I would say, although I don't really know what uh, these kind of networks are, it should perfectly fit for that as well. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. So Rodrigo, you know, uh, maybe you let us know at SBMF uh, 2021, how it works for this. Um, I also have a question, Martin, um, about yes. the size of the um, alphabet. In your examples, you have A and B. But uh, when I see neural networks, they take this uh, multidimensional vectors of floating point values. So how does it, does your approach deal with alphabet sizes? No, I mean, we basically uh, had right from the beginning that we fixed the alphabet size. We somehow said, okay, we have this um, finite part. We have a finite alphabet. And it's not that we abstracted the input to a finite alphabet. The finite alphabet was uh, preset in the beginning. Um, but the, the size of the alphabet, I mean, of course it has a certain influence for the system, but um, yeah, I don't know. So uh, of course, if it goes into the thousands and so on, then the standard L star algorithm wouldn't work. Okay, thank you. More questions? If not, we can compliment ourselves on this excellent time management. It's uh, two o'clock um, in Europe, uh, 10 a.m. in Brazil. So um, we finish um, this uh, keynote session here and let's all uh, have um, virtual hands for uh, Martin Leuker from Lübeck again. Uh, yeah, thank you for giving me the opportunity to share my ideas. Yes, and since we already had questions for the other keynote talks as well, um, if you have the possibility of uh, making the slides available for us, um, then we would uh, link them uh, on the uh, on, sure. on the web page, or you give us a link to them on your personal uh, website. Okay, then um, this concludes this session. Uh, Rodrigo, yes. Gustavo, does anyone want to say something about the upcoming sessions? Uh, we have a break now uh, for half an hour, 30 minutes, and then we resume with uh, 
a tutorial uh, of ETMF on theorem proving by Leopoldo Teixeira. Okay. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Martin. Goodbye. Enjoy Thank the you. weekend. Bye.